Hi, my name is Lubo, and this is a Ratio podcast. We do a variety of discussions with scientists from a number of fields, and we try to go in depth on topics mostly to do with the physical world. And our main focus is also the place of science and technology in our modern informational landscape. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Matthew Cobb. Matthew is a zoologist from the University of Manchester. His research is largely focused on the sense of smell. He's a widely known pop sci author of books such as The Egg and Sperm Race, uh, the 17th century scientist who unraveled the secret of sex, life and growth, life's greatest secret, the race to crack the genetic code, the idea of the brain, a history, and of course his latest book, uh, which is titled The Genetic Age, A Perilous Quest to Edit Life. Matthew is also a good friend of mine, and it's absolutely lovely seeing him again at our forum this year on June 3rd, where he spoke about genetic engineering. In this episode, we focused mostly on the olfactory, on smells, uh, their relation to neuroplasticity, the contextual and emotional memory that has to do with smell, attraction, the cultural context, and of course, Matthew being uh, the renaissance man that he is, we couldn't help but talk a bit on history, a bit of uh, culture, and a brief aside about the usefulness of metaphors. I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I did. So, Matthew. What's up, man? Lubo, I'm back in Sofia. You definitely are back. <laughs> how, is, uh, how is Sofia treating you this time around? Uh, very well. I'm... Um, as always, very pleased to be here. It's a lovely place and Ratio are a lovely group. It's fantastic. That's that's good to hear, man. I mean, um, we've been we've been for some reason alive for eleven years now. Yeah. Actually close to twelve years. So it's really interesting to see people we've we've had from the beginning, actually. You're one of our first speakers. That's right. And yeah. I think came in twenty thirteen, something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. That's probably the our our first or second year of the uh, second year. Yeah. It yeah. was it was really good. Yeah, I don't know why you you decided to actually come the first time around. It's some you we emailed people. me. You yeah. emailed me. You said you want to come, and I thought I've never been to Bulgaria. Why not? <laughs> just some cold calling, cold emailing. Just like, oh, would you like to come? And I'm like, I'm definitely not going to come. <laughs> you show up. What, what right. the hell? I I check you out. You were real, so why not? You know, I mean, what are you going to do? Harvest my organs, and I don't know. You know, well, the I worst mean, thing could have been. <laughs> It was always in the cars, you know. I mean, it's uh, yeah. We were uh, rough on the budget, so you know. <laughs> so Matthew, you, from from the beginning, for us, you were the smell guy. Mm -hmm. You you were uh, with the back in back in the day. Uh, it, you were with one of the weirdest topics from uh, from the point of view of what kind of scientific uh, lectures were going on in Sofia back in the day. But you know, ten years on, and even more. Uh, smell is still a thing that's really interesting for, for us and our audience. So, for example, in, in March this year, we had a whole, uh, the whole topic for the, for the month, for podcasts, for events, etc., was mostly related to memory. And it seems like smell was like the underpinning mm. uh, of all our discussions about memory. It, it was always contextualized somehow with smell. So what, what's going on there? I mean, uh, is it is it a relationship because of closeness with the hippocampus? Is it some deeper kind of relationship with smell that uh, we can explore? Well, it does involve the hippocampus in uh, in humans and vertebrates, but it's not only in uh, it's not only in vertebrates. So basically, in, in any animal, when it identifies a smell, when it smells something, it does two things. It identifies what it is. You have a whole set of kind of computational processes which are very similar in different species, even though they may have completely different evolutionary uh, pasts. And then you also tag whatever is happening, whatever perception you're having. So that's the raw material of memory, mm. the place you are, and so on. You then tag that set of neuronal activity with a smell uh, mm. or with the information about the smell that's going on at the same time. Now, most of the time, that's kind of irrelevant. And it, like, we don't remember most things. We don't mm. remember in general, the smells that are associated with it. But sometimes for reasons we don't understand, those memory smell attachments become very profound. And in a way it's like you can replay 
the memory. Mm. So we know from experiments on, on humans that uh, if you put electrodes into people's brains, these, you know, these are people who are willing yeah. to have this done because they're being we, operated We on. try not to do it yeah. that often. But <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to be doing it on you today. Yeah. Um, but these are people who are having operations for epilepsy or whatever, and they yeah. allow researchers to, before they do the operation, to fiddle around. It's very kind of them, very generous. Um, but you can actually, by putting electrodes into different parts of the brain, you can actually replay memories. And people will suddenly remember what it was like when they were a child hmm. and you know their mother telling them off because they'd done their buttons up the wrong way. Or they were, in one case, a woman started singing a song that she had heard as a child. Hmm. So these very profound memories and the people who've experienced this say it's a bit like, a bit like being in a dream. Suddenly you're in there. And the same kind of thing we think is happening with smells, except then rather than having an electrode, you've got the, the smell tag. The tag can actually reactivate those memories that are sitting there, which aren't necessarily of significant events, mm. but generally involve place and some experience. So the classic kind of thing is you'll smell something that you haven't smelt for ages, and it takes you back to when mm -hmm. you were a child. And it's almost like you are there in your grandmother's kitchen and you're you're quite short now. You're not mm. you're not an adult. You're now a child again, and your grandmother's up there, and you can smell the stew or whatever it was she was making. Mm. And it takes you back. And that very, very powerful memory. I mean, this is, as many people know, at the heart, or it's the beginning of Proust's uh, A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, where he, he dunks his Madeleine into his tea, and it's the mixture of the smell and the taste takes him back to when yeah. he was a child. So we've all experienced this, and it's very, very real. But like, um, if we have to go slightly technical, because obviously we have um, long-term memory that's not related to smell, so we can encode memory in a way that's entirely um separated from smell let's say you can have a memory related to some visual phenomena or, or mm -hmm. conversation or something um so the transition from short-term memory to long-term memory uh is uh is a process of basically just keeping stuff that's important for us for some reason probably some evolutionary mechanism that works for us etc but then smell comes in and if I understand you correctly, in a way, it's both as a marker and an amplifier, or is well, it? Well, some... It's a tag. It's a tag. But sometimes that can mm -hmm. that you can repl you can use the tag as a stimulus, right? Hmm. You, uh, if you if you stimulate the tag and you smell the smell again, then you get access to those memories which you haven't thought about for for mm. decades. The the in general, uh, the way we think about memory forming in uh, humans is through the hippocampus, or you've got two hippocampuses, which are mm. these things that supposedly look like seahorses, which is very strange, yes. uh, which are at the kind of eye, eye level, uh, uh, at the base of your brain. And part of your olfactory signal goes through there. And we know, one of the main reasons we know about the hippocampus is because of a case of a, a very famous uh, patient called H.M., Hmm. We now know his real name was Henry Molison, but in all the papers that were published, he was just called HM because he was still alive and, and anonymity hmm. was preserved. And he had a an absolutely catastrophic uh, experiment or operation performed on hmm. him in the 1950s. They removed his hippocampuses. They also removed a lot of other stuff, but basically, they, I mean, it was a really brutal experiment. They were trying to relieve his uh, terrible epilepsy because he had hmm. debilitating epilepsy. The completely unexpected and catastrophic consequence was that he couldn't form any long-term memories. Mm. So he lived in the permanent now. So he, was, he did experiments. People studied him for decades and they would meet him mm. and they'd met him dozens of times before. But every time for him, it was a new yeah. event. He'd go, hey, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm happy to help you. <laughs> but he couldn't remember having met them the day before. He couldn't remember anything over a day. So he lived in the permanent now. It's really very, very tragic. Now, this gave us all sorts of insight. I mean, it wasn't quite as simple as that because he would then remember stuff that had happened after the operation. He'd talk about uh, astronauts or something like that mm. or President Kennedy being assassinated, which mm. you know mm. had happened decades later. So clearly his memory wasn't, long-term memory wasn't completely destroyed, but it yeah. was largely uh, destroyed through this terrible operation. But one of the things that he also could not do 
is he couldn't identify smells. Hmm. He couldn't identify, I mean, you'd give him a lemon and say, what does this smell of? And he'd say, well, that's a lemon. So stuff that he'd learned before hmm. the operation was still intact. Hmm. He knew what a lemon was, but he would claim it didn't smell right. Hmm. And he couldn't remember smells. He couldn't identify many smells. So there was something about his olfactory system that had already been damaged. Because although, I think the point about the brain, we often think of it as these kind of units. Yes, the hippocampus is the gateway to memory. Mm. That's one of the things people say. But in fact, you know, the, the brain isn't a computer. Yes. <laughs> as, I, as I told you in a talk in 2020, and uh, yes. I think it's still available on, on, the, on the Facebook page, yeah, Ratio? Yes. And on YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Uh, the brain isn't like a computer. It doesn't yeah. have separate components that only do one thing. It's all into, it, it, they have primary roles, yeah. but that activity is being modulated by other parts of the brain. It's, and it is all horribly, horribly interconnected in a way that a computer isn't. Yeah, yeah. In a way, so basically, even though that we know that the hippocampus assists in forming long-term memory, there's some kind of uh, um, shared functionality in yeah. other parts of the brain. But uh, what, there was a few things that uh, got my attention in, in what you were mentioning. So, so basically, he retained um, previous memories and not only memories, I guess. I guess concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So would. <clears throat> Would we say that concept formation is a different thing than memory formation? So hmm. let's say the, the idea of uh, seeing a monkey and knowing what a monkey is, not just the memory of a monkey somewhere in the zoo or whatever, but rather just the, the whole thing, you know, being able to represent it mentally in a way, you know, manifest it, just draw a monkey or make the sounds that a monkey does, etc. Is creating a concept a different process from a memory? Well, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer uh, because I think the vast majority of tests on HM were to do precisely with, you know, mm. learning a string of numbers or a fact or whatever. Mm. And clearly, I mean, that's a very interesting idea that a concept, I mean, let's say they taught him, I don't know, they they, they, they taught him about some bit of geometry, mm. you know, the, the, exactly. the, the, something that he hadn't known before. Would he have been able to remember that? I, my, I suspect probably not, because even if, you know, a fact or an event or a place, which is particularly what the hippocampus does. It's mm. very important for knowing where you are in space. And mm. that's the link with, when I said, when you smell something, yeah. you're Thanks back in back. the place, you're in the place yeah. and you have the sense of space. And the hippocampus helps to determine yeah. that, enable you to identify space. Um, I think that going through that and then spreading into other networks would be essential even for learning some concept. I mean, if you try to teach HM about equals MC squared, say, mm. uh, if he hadn't known it before, I think he still would have had difficulty. But I, I don't know mm. uh, of any of the research they did that actually focused more on concept formation rather than facts and you know, simple, simpler memories. That's a very interesting question. I, I'll mm. have to find out. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. The three most important words in science, right? I don't know. Yeah. Either because we don't know, and nobody's done the experiment, or, or I don't know, in which case I'll have to go and find out. Well, it's unknowable. I mean, there, we can imagine th stuff that's well, unknowable, but that's a bit yeah, philosophical. No, we, there are indeed. <laughs> I mean, but uh, you can stand, even if you, it may think it's pretty unknowable, I don't know, like the nature of consciousness, Yes, it may eventually yeah. be knowable and we can take steps before, towards it and work out experiments that could at least test some hypotheses. That's the exciting bit of science. It's not knowing yeah. stuff, it's finding new stuff out. Oh, it's a process, definitely, yeah. definitely. There's there's a bunch of stuff I'd like to address afterwards with uh, specifically with, with science and, you know, the boundaries of what we consider science and then pseudoscience and is there is there a weird place in the middle? Yeah. But before that, um, so... We were talking in those events in March a lot about neuroplasticity mm -hmm. in general. So, um, again, when you say that smell is a marker uh, in a sense, and it's for my entirely untrained ear, um, again, I, I try to contextualize it as something that's still a kind of a stimulus or, or you yeah. can act as a stimulus. Does this mean that, um, uh, you know, in layman terms, can we imagine a way in which we can use smells to stimulate neuroplasticity? Well, that's you can do that. And for example, one of the, well, I won't say it's a good thing, but one of the consequences of the pandemic has been that uh, anosmia, so the inability to smell, hmm. or uh, phantosmia, 
which is when you smell things that aren't there, or parosmia, which is where previously now s- nice smells now smell horrible. Mm. All those conditions, which before the pandemic were kind of dismissed by uh, physicians. If you went to see your doctor and you said you have one of these phenomena, they'd go, well, there's nothing we can do. It's tough. You've got to live with it. Mm. But so many people in particular in the first wave of the pandemic were affected by their sense of smell. Eventually, mm. they the medics accepted this is actually a, a sign that uh, you've got COVID, you may have no other symptom. That And the consequences of long COVID, where people have had carrying on having conditions and symptoms for, for months or years, that now uh, the possibility of perhaps recovering some of that damaged smell by stimulating your nerves, your olfactory nerves, has become very important. So mm. there's something called smell training which has largely been developed by Thomas Hummel in uh, Germany, but there's a, a British charity called Absent, as scent as in smell. Yeah. Uh, you see what they did? Uh, that does does this in the UK, and they have, in fact, they do it all over the world. Uh, so you want to, people who've got any problems like this could check out absent.org hmm. or another charity in the UK is called fifthsense.org.uk. Fifth and they deal with smell and taste problems, in particular those that have arisen since COVID. And what Thomas Hummel has shown is that people who've lost their sense of smell because of COVID or other diseases can affect your sense of smell, that it may be possible to recover uh, some normal function by giving yourself very strong uh, stimulation of things hmm. like you know, things like ammonia and other very sharp smells. And you do it regularly over several days and weeks, and then you can sometimes recover function. So hmm. the plasticity, which is there in general in the nervous system, but not always, and in particular uh, in olfaction, because our nerve cells that are doing the actual detecting, which are high up, about eye level, dangling down through the base of your skull, right? That's right, they're like this down there. Um, they are continually recreated. They're stem cells, they're continually redeveloping. So yeah. for example, you can take one of these cells, if you're a mouse, get one from a mouse nose, and create a new mouse. It can turn into mm. a new mouse, right? It can yeah. develop into an embryo. So they're very, they're very special cells. They're like the cells we have that make our red blood cells, called stem cells. They can become anything. Um, but the cells don't just have to be there because they're continually regenerating. Mm. They've got to go to the right place in the brain, the other side of the, the base of your skull. And in some cases through disease, or in particular, people who have head injuries, you can fall over in the street mm trip up over a pavement, say, Especially in Sophia. In Sophia, in right, Sophia right. it is possible. It's absolutely doable. Um, you can bang your head, and then the nerves, because they're going down through this base of the brain, get ch- cut yeah. as the, the sharp blow hits your head. So you can lose your sense of smell. Your mm. nerve cells will then redevelop, but they've got to find their way right mm. back to the same place. And that often is difficult. So uh, that's more hard, that's harder to recreate. And mm. some, sometimes mm. if people have had a head injury and they lost the sense of smell, well, that's it. There may well be no recovery from that. Yeah. It's probabilistic, basically. It's, it, it depends on what kind of damage you've got. So, for example, people who smell, one of the main features of the COVID pandemic has been uh, what's called parosmia. So in particular, coffee... Hmm. people now find that it smells disgusting. It smells of feces. It's a very, very common phenomenon. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, absolutely. So you can't <laughs> stomach coffee. because Now, what's happened there is if you imagine that your 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 scent smells cells a bit like playing a, a piano. You've played a chord. Yeah. Coffee is your fingers. Brum, it makes yeah. a lovely chord. But now, let's say all the black keys have been damaged. Hmm. So now you play that, and rather than brum, it goes, nah. <laughs> and it's really not very nice. So... And they've been able to work out which are the groups of neurons that have been affected because it's so many people have had it and they've tried to study what is it that people are now smelling differently mm. in the in the bouquet of coffee, because coffee is composed of hundreds of different molecules. Mm. And it's just some of those molecules which are detected differently yeah. and that are producing this discordant, unpleasant phenomenon. Huh. Now, we can't cure it still, but by doing smell training, that may be for some people a partial solution to recover this plasticity. But what, what's going on there? I mean, it's basically the, the structure of the molecule that we detect mm-hmm. because, right, we, our detection uh, hasn't changed itself. I mean, the, the, the place that the molecule hits 
isn't any different. It's an interpretation of uh, that interaction. Yeah. yeah, it's the neuron has been altered in some way. Either it's been completely damaged. Yeah. Uh, either it seems more likely that COVID doesn't directly affect our smell neurons, but it's the, the cells on either <laughs> around it that then get damaged and the cell then can't function properly. Yeah. Um, and that means either that the 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 neuron isn't there anymore it's simply not yeah. you have lost the black keys or maybe it's got to be pressed a lot more you need a lot more or a lot less it's become hypersensitive or huh. too you know hyposensitive and so it's not responding in the right way and you get this yep. this unpleasant sensation but yeah and, 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 i mean your brain is interpreting everything. You, you, yeah. If you press your eyeballs, you see light. Yes. But there's no light there. <laughs> that you're simply yeah. stimulating your uh, optic nerve, and the brain says, my optic nerve's been stimulated. Mm. That's light. So that's how you perceive it. Yeah. That's a really weird thing because um, the, you mentioned a few things that are related to the fact that, end of the day, we, we're in a physical world. So, okay, so smell is some kind of a particle uh, is basically hitting your your senses light again well we're basically a black box that interacts with the world around us and it's not exactly a one or zero type of thing it's we're not a computer it's it's kind of a, a gradual thing it's a it's a gradient so when we say that we have a hyper stimulus so we're, we're basically throwing a bunch more stuff at, at our senses in order to detect this and uh, for me that's it's it's a really weird thing to wrap my head around so um because when we give explanations about be it our brain or other uh, forms of uh, physiology, etc., uh, it's sometimes way too abstract. You know, it goes into an abstraction that kind of um, doesn't take into account, let's say, the, the form of a molecule, uh, especially when we give uh, popular science lectures, etc., or the processes it themselves was the realism that they would uh, happen so w with your example about um, um let's say the reformation of um, some kind of uh, after an injury you know uh, the nerve cells can find their way again mm -hmm. uh, toward the right place but again it's probabilistic it's it tries to navigate in a physical medium etc so i don't know um i don't know how this is actually end of the day ever explainable uh, without just, uh, well, we know the rough idea of it, but how would we make it um, entirely deterministic? It's what I'm trying to get to. So we know we know the process in some yeah. uh, parts of, uh, of science, but end of the day, there's a bunch of molecules hidden in your nose. There's a bunch of neurons in your brain. It's a really, really complex system. Yeah. So how how do we actually analyze this? Uh, Don't with know. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I mean, this is a, a, a major problem, and there are different kind of approaches that people take. There are some people who want to tackle it head on hmm. and try and you know create complicated models of how brains uh, might function, interpret the world. The other solution, which is one that I've generally adopted, is to take a much more reductionist approach and to look at a very simple system. And that's why I studied maggot noses for, for so long, a very simple system where I can mm. study a single cell and try and understand the principles yeah. that are involved there. The problem with that is you're missing out the big picture. And in particular, when it comes to humans, there's all sorts, I mean, you know, studying it's a, a huge single picture. cell in a maggot is not the same thing as a, a human single cell, never mind a human nose and mm. whole function. So... Um, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm coming down on, oh, well, on the one hand and on the other, and we need a bit of both. Uh, I mean, I tend to think that the reductionist principle is what has served us very well so far, but you need to recognize the limits of it and that you're only going to be looking at a particular part of the system. Um, and that in particular, when you're dealing with humans, because of the kind of plasticity that you've mentioned, there are many things that are very surprising. So one of the, th I, I said humans, human brain is not like a computer. Yep. Right. There's one exception, and I'm using it now, right? And that is what's called Broca's area, which is the front left-hand side of your brain, hmm. and that is where speech is produced. Hmm. And this was one of the first localizations of function, as they call hmm. it, where it became absolutely apparent that if you had a stroke and you started to slur your speech, 
that you would have had damage on the front left hand side. Hmm. And you can, there are videos on the internet, you can see this on YouTube, you can see people who are speaking, and then people get a scientist get this great big electromagnet and they put it to the side of their brain. Hmm. Blah, 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 and now they can't speak anymore. Right? I mean, I wouldn't have that. I mean, it's pretty, completely safe, but it sounds rather terrible. I think I'll pass. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, you know, because the electromagnetic field is going to disrupt the activity of your the neurons in that part of your brain, you can't speak anymore. Yeah. So that is a bit like I don't know the video card in your computer, right? Yeah. We know that decades, centuries now of evidence proves this, and yet uh, last year this fantastic paper came out. Uh, the joint work of a group of people who are into brain scanning yeah. and a woman in America who's in her late 30s. She heard about they were doing these scans on brains and she yeah. wrote to them and said, uh, you might want to look at my brain. I've been told it's quite interesting. So they said, well, okay, come on in. I think they probably thought, yeah, we've got a crank here. <laughs> but no, they put her in the scanner and you know she's perfectly normal. She's college educated. Absolutely everything yeah. about her is normal. And they looked at it and they said, oh, because the front left, well, in fact, the whole left side of her brain is completely absent. She has no Broca's area. She has, n there's a big hole. You can see the paper online and there's this big black part of her front part wow. of her brain. So from when she was young? Or? Well, that's yeah. what, what their hypothesis is that when she was actually an embryo. So even before she was born, when she was yeah. a fetus, um, there was a stroke in her brain and that destroyed or led to the, 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 you know, the disintegration of all this part of her brain. And then she's born and, or even before she's born, she can hear things, right? You can, babies hear things in yeah. the womb. We know they react to sounds of the la mother's language. As soon as they come out, they will react preferentially to the sounds that the mother has been speaking yeah. than to any other language. So yeah. we learn the sounds of a language. We don't learn the language, we learn the sounds of it. And then she's interacting with the world and her brain is hmm. sufficiently plastic for the brain to find a way, we don't understand, but it's clearly got to be on the other side yeah. of her brain, that she can speak perfectly normally. So this is incredibly wow. unusual and it's to do with being young. And yeah. uh, I mean, we know children soak up language like sponges. They learn languages yeah. and they can speak languages in a way that those of us who are older can't. So, you know, yeah. anybody listening who speaks more than one language at home and has got a child, speak to the child in both languages because yeah. it will learn them. It will just adopt them. So this, this woman was incredibly lucky in a way that she this happened very early. Well, yeah. she she didn't know she wouldn't have known any no, different no loss if she had as well. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, she's absolutely normal. Is she? But she, sometime in her twenties, she was in a study, and people said, "Oh, yeah, you haven't got a left front side of your brain." But this weird. is really weird in evolutional terms. I mean, if if something could have been, um, you know, saved in terms of energy expenditure, etc. I mean, if we could have had brains that are basically half the size, and I'm guessing the the energy consumption of her brain is less than... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. It would be weird if, if it's got an yeah. uh, um, equal well, yield. Well, maybe then. I mean, I have no idea of the density. I mean, you could imagine that the density of neurons on the other side is substantially hmm. increased, right? So she's now got a super dense brain, but super it's all crammed brain. into one side. Um, and that that's she's able to carry out, as far as we know, all the functions. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing in her behavior or everyday life that suggests any problem at all. If you weren't in a scanner, if you weren't put in a scanner, you wouldn't know. But wouldn't, wouldn't natural selection try and do that ex specifically? I mean, end of the day, if, if that amount of brain could have been skipped, I mean, wouldn't uh, nature be like, ah, you don't need that? Well, I mean, only if, as I say, that, uh, I mean, maybe that she is missing some function. Yeah. That maybe, you know, if you're a tiger, maybe she can't detect you as quickly. Right? right, in terms of so, survival. Yeah, so yeah. there may be something else. We yeah. don't know. I mean, you know, yeah. she survives perfectly well in, in a social a, context. In yeah. the, you know, early 21st century America, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's perfectly normal. She can get yeah. by. Yeah. Put That's her true. into the savannah, uh, being chased <laughs> by cheetahs or something, and maybe it wouldn't, or jaguars, you know, it wouldn't go somewhere. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. Um, or it may simply be, as I say, that in fact, she has exactly the same number of neurons, but they're just kind of crammed into the space. And then you get into the issue as well, why is your head so big anyway? I and mean, it's not only for uh, fitting your brain into it, but there's also going to be all sorts of things uh, to do with heat dissipation yeah. that maybe, again, in the long term, people like that. If we were to have people with only half-size heads, mm. 
maybe they couldn't lose their heat so much because we don't yeah. really need to save heat. You Sometimes you need to get rid of it. So we've got lovely bald heads, so we can yes. radiate heat, yes. you know, really, really well. I radiate everything. It's heat, <laughs> it's uh, empathy, it's intelligence. So maybe if our heads were half the size, we were, but still with the same density, with an increased density of neurons, yeah. Using the same energy, maybe we then have a problem about heat dissipation. I mean, I'm just making that up, but that's yeah. that's one of the things you need to think about. I don't think yeah. our brains, our skull sizes, is simply to fit the brain in. It does all enables us to do all sorts of other. Oh things. yeah, there's probably some amount of sexual sexual selection as well. I mean, I think baldness is uh, remarkably attractive. I, I entirely agree. <laughs> My entire experience is uh, related to this. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so. Um, one thing that um, we keep coming back to in most of our events in the last uh, few years is cultural context. Um, this comes up in studies about uh, brains. This comes up in uh, work to do with uh, physics, all kinds of stuff. It seems like the way that we interpret uh, results and the way that uh, uh, different ideas are formed uh, are different big because of the culture or because of the language in which uh, they're set up. So when we're talking about smells, uh, can we uh, imagine that the way that I interpret smells, let's say coffee is mm -hmm. a good example as well. For me, coffee is amazing. Um, I mean, I enjoy the smell of coffee, etc. And even if you don't have a specific kind of a pathology or you know issue or just got smacked on the head, etc., can we imagine a culture in which that it's, Interps, interprets the physical signal in exactly the same way. It basically works the same way, but the software that got mm. uh, underneath, end of the day, interprets this as something uh, not preferable for yeah, some reason. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, so feces, right? Yeah, amazing. The smell of shit. Yeah. Um, now, people in general, are, in general are repulsed by that. Yeah. But children aren't. Children don't, I mean, it's not an inherent, there are some smells like vomit, okay? So if you smell vomit, yeah, and if that's, you don't, no. that's not good, and furthermore, you will start to feel sick, right? And you yeah. can see why that, yeah. in evolutionary terms, and that works in you know all mammals that are social. If they smell vomit, then they want to vomit because mm. you know your neighbours. Maybe we ate the same food. They're sick. I better get it out. That's why. Yeah. If anybody's sick on an airplane, it's a catastrophe because it then very rapidly spreads through the the air. But smells like feces aren't inherently disgusting and children don't find it so. And it's something they learn because we say, oh, no, that's disgusting, you know, don't play with it or whatever. Mm, I mean, mm. Babies in general or toddlers, when they see this stuff coming out of them, are very intrigued by it, you know. Uh, they, they, they want to know what it is and they're not repulsed by the smell. So mm. that's something we learn. It's not something that's innate, unlike the smell of vomit, which has got different kind mm. of much deeper uh, roots. And different cultures use smell in very, very different ways. Um, there are various tribes, uh, indigenous peoples that will identify, you, you know, in, if you're living in the jungle, it's very difficult to find your way mm. because it's incredibly dense and so on. You can't navigate by yeah. a hilltop or anything. You can't see anything except the, the rainforest. But there are plants and mm. those plants have different smells. And there have been lots of studies showing that people uh, living in this way will navigate by smell. They mm. will, you know, okay, well, that, that tree is over there. That's producing that nice smell. That tree is over there. Mm. That's not so nice. Okay, we need to steer close to the one that doesn't smell so nice to get to the river mm. or whatever it is. Yeah. So different peoples have different habits of using smell in their culture. Um, and I, I wrote a little book about this called A Very Short Introduction to Smell. And one of the most interesting things, parts of it, so much of it is about the kind of thing we've been talking about, about the, the genetics, the physiology, the ecology mm. of smell. But the really interesting stuff that I wrote about was um, the stuff I didn't really know, which is smelling culture, which was fascinating. Uh, so probably the first novel that was ever written was written in Japanese hmm. about the year 1000, by a woman, in fact. And smell plays an absolutely fundamental role in the novel in terms of punctuating hmm. the day uh, and is used as a, a signifier, a cultural signifier. Um, in the cave paintings that were made 
in France, in Lascaux, these fantastic cave paintings mm. uh, that were made around about 20 odd thousand years ago. So they're, they're extraordinary. You know, you can see these magnificent bulls. People don't know what I'm talking mm. about. Go online, just put Lascaux. It's got an X at the end. And you'll see these amazing paintings. They We can put some links in the, in yeah, the podcast description. Yeah. They were discovered in 1940 uh, by a couple of teenagers whose dog disappeared down a hole. They went down the hole after the dog and eventually they discovered this astonishing cave. Now, so it looks beautiful and it would have been, uh, we know it sounds beautiful as well because people have shown mm. that there are echoes, the places where people chose to put up the paintings, there are particular echoes. So you can imagine people would have been chanting there or mm. singing or something. But not only that, how did they see in the dark? Well, they saw in the dark because by making lamps. So we have sandstone lamps that are found on the floors of these mm. caves. And those lamps had animal fat in them. And the wicks, so they had a little candle, mm, mm. the wicks were either of juniper or pine. Mm. So there are, you know, other twigs are available yeah. in the area, but they chose the ones that sent it. So you yeah. can imagine that, in fact, what we see is just, you know, a brilliantly lit image taken with a flash would have had the flickering of these these uh, these candles yeah. and the smell, the kind of bacony, fatty smell of the the yeah. animal fat, but then also the smell of pine or juniper. Cool. And then people singing around you. So the whole thing becomes very moody. This, yeah. But absolutely it's complete multi-sensory uh, experience. So yeah, smells have been important from the very beginning. Cool. That's really cool. And I have just one more thing about smells. I know I've dwelled on this, but Fine. it's really, really interesting for me. So um, again, back to my uh, point about it's it's a physical world, right? And there's, I think, I mean, from from just thinking about how smells work, there's a finite amount of the types of molecules that you can potentially be in contact with in order to be able to smell something. So, I mean, that's, it has to be a product either of, uh, of nature or some kind of industrial design, etc. So this means that um, um, in a way we have a range that we haven't explored because you can imagine molecules that have been specifically designed in a way in which to um, be detected by uh, by our olfactory system. Uh, is that the case, or have we adapted specifically to the to the smells that are available? And if tomorrow we do a molecule that's entirely uh, uh, entirely foreign and entirely artificial, uh, can we can we then say that we will detect a smell that we haven't smelled before, or mm -hmm. would this? fit into a gradient of a type of smell that we know exists already? Um, right, I'm, I'm not, I don't think we really know the answer to that, but the, the principle you've touched on is really important. <clears throat> so the sense of smell works by this really complicated peripheral activity. So that's the very first contact that you have with the smell is through your neurons. So mm. you've got 400 kinds of receptor. There are 400 genes in your genome hmm. that encode for receptor, encode for smell receptors. Now, it's not quite as simple as that because you've got two versions of those genes, hmm. one from your mum, one from your dad. And we don't quite know how that works. Those genes won't be identical. There's huge variation in humans hmm. in their olfactory receptor genes. But so you could, in fact, have 800 different types because you've got two slightly different versions, hmm. perhaps, for each receptor from each parent. But anyway, let's imagine you've just got 400. Let's imagine they're all the same. Each of those receptors can be activated by more than one smell. Hmm. And each smell can activate more than one kind of receptor. Hmm. So if effectively, we don't know what the limit is. Hmm. to the number of smells there are that we can detect. One computer model based on some uh, studies of people's responses, and then they kind of did some fancy maths to you know, say, well, okay, in principle, what would be the number of smells we could detect? Uh, the answer they came up with was, was trillions of smells, right? <laughs> That's cool. So, uh, and there are trillions of different molecules that are possible, right? Uh, so we don't know. I, I think effectively the limit is, we don't know what the limit is. It used to be said that, oh, you know, somebody who works in the perfume industry or, uh, you know, somebody who t smells wine, they can detect 20. A connoisseur. Yeah, they can detect 20,000 different smells. And then about five years ago, somebody said, well, 
why do we always say that? Where does that number come from? Because, yeah. you know, we, the professionals, yeah. the scientists working, this yeah. is this, this, this yeah. a well-known fact. And then they kind of pulled on the thread in the literature and it, it just disintegrated. There's no, no, there's no evidence for it at all. <laughs> like the raccoon with the yeah. eyes. Yeah, that's right. It just disappeared. <laughs> um, so the uh, it seems as though there's no limit to the number of smells we can detect. Now, there must be some rules about it, right? Mm. We know there are some basic rules. So things with sulfury rings, molecules that have got sulfury rings smell kind of farty, right? Yeah. Um, there are other smells that smell kind of fruity. But as I showed back in 2013, you can change a single atom of carbon. Our sense of smell is so sensitive that mm. two molecules that differ by just one atom smell different. Mm. One will smell kind of rosy, the other will smell kind of orangey. Just that single atom of carbon changes it. So in principle, we should be able to work out how our we're responding to all these smells, a particular shape, what kind of response it produ should produce. And until very recently, we've just gone, well, there must be some rule, but we don't know what it is. Mm. So as some listeners will perhaps be thinking, well, wait a minute, couldn't we give all that data to an AI and get it to work it out? And that's exactly what uh, people have done. So Google have been very interested in this. They yeah. put a lot of money in it. They set up a startup because precisely it might be possible to engineer new smells that could be significant, say for, or smells and tastes are clearly very linked, but it may be possible to make medicines more palatable mm. by introducing some very powerful uh, smell molecule mm. that will then change the way something tastes if it's a particular bitter mm. tasting medicine. So the, 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 the drug that you're taking may be inherently unpleasant and bitter, and there's nothing we can do about that because if we mm. change its structure, it won't work anymore. So yeah. maybe by accompanying the changing the way it's accompanied, yeah. you can actually alter its palatability. And it does seem as, I mean, yeah, not surprisingly, the AI can see patterns that we can't. That's all yeah. we can do. Uh, and we're beginning now to understand something uh, about the rules that will enable people to design new smells mm. that we'd never sensed before. But... Clearly, we can't smell, you know, there, we may be able to smell trillions of smells, but I don't know how many conceivable molecules there are in the universe. Yeah. Bazillions, you know, an, yeah. an incredible variety. So there will be some things that we can't smell and we'll never to be able to smell because we don't have the, the right the right genes to enable them hmm. to smell. I mean, this is the same in, in all that, you know, so cats, you know, you know cats, Lou, but... Plenty, you, plenty of cats are known to me. Yeah. Um, they can't taste anything sweet. They cannot, so they don't have the- Thank God. Yeah, they don't. Well, they still like ice cream, right? Yeah. So they'll get very excited yeah. about ice cream, but whatever they're tasting, it's nothing to do with sweetness. It's to do with huh. the fat or there's something in there they like, but they cannot taste sweet. Huh. Those genes are not present in their genome because they're carnivores, right? They're yeah. obligate carnivores. They're not like a dog that'll eat anything. So, you know, it yeah. tastes everything like humans, you know, we're yeah. omnivores. So cats are obligate carnivores, not much sweet in a piece of meat. A yeah. you know, mouse doesn't <laughs> taste sweet, just tastes meaty. So they've lost those genes. All cats have lost those genes. And mm. yet there's still some things that we give them as treats or whatever, like ice cream, which they mm. think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, our, our genes are ultimately going to shape our perception of the world. Mm. Uh, yeah, we can't see ultraviolet light. You know, bees mm. can, we can't. Yeah. Uh, and that, so although we have the impression that we have this, unmediated contact with the, the re, with reality, you know, mm. that you, yeah, it's just there. You can see through your eyes, you mm. hear your ears, or you smell or whatever. Uh, it's actually clearly filtered. It's filtered, filtered by all those organs. And there are some things, you know, I'm now getting quite old, so I can't hear bats anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, really high You can't high hear bats. Yeah, I can't, bats... May, young people can hear I've bats. I've never heard bats. I mean, yeah. I've, I've heard of bats flapping around yeah. and just No, no, flying, bat, bats make very high-pitched sounds. So uh, in, in the USA, they, they use this as a way of uh, trying to drive away teenagers from hanging around, <laughs> hanging around street <laughs> corners. They play very high-pitched sounds, which old folk can't hear, so they're happy. Yeah. They can walk around. <laughs> and the teenagers go, oh, my God, you bastards, what are you doing? You're... <laughs> Terrible noise. I, it, they tried it in the UK and the government banned it. They said it was uh, kind of really That's unpleasant. That's cruel. Yeah, in absolutely. A, a I mean, you know, young people way. have a hard enough time as it is without playing high-pitched sounds. But that shows you, you know, that as you get older, there are some things your body yeah. doesn't do anymore. Um, if you get ill, 
then you may lose your sense of taste or sense of smell, hmm. uh, in particular following the first round of COVID. And that just re when that happens, it's like when, you know, you if you damage yourself, you get an injury, hmm. you know, you suddenly can't run in the same way or walk in the hmm. same way. And it's uh, almost a shocking reminder of your yeah. mortality yeah. and of your frailties yes. and that you are in a body, that that yeah. body needs to be looked after. That's... Um... Uh, when you said that basically we are uh, with a filtered access to reality there's there's a few there's a few points to this so i mean uh okay so obviously our senses are adapted in a way that that actually useful for us so ultraviolet light wasn't that wasn't mm -hmm. that useful um in that sense smell and you know we've adapted to stuff okay so vomit obviously something that's relevant to us surviving etc but end of the day um this goes through an interpretation by by the brain in a way to actually make a better forecast model of the world. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, when we think about um, the brain as a as a forecast machine, basically, again, mm -hmm. it's a metaphor. No, um, no, I'm, I'm quite okay. That's one of the fundamental things the brain yeah. does. It represents the outside world yes. and makes predictions about what will happen if it does various things. And, and obviously, some, some short-term predictions are more accurate than long-term predictions, although long-term predictions allow us to do stuff like agriculture and a bunch yeah, of other stuff. It yeah. allows us uh, to actually plan. Um, that, that's going to be a frontier type of question. So would you say that that kind of a forecasting uh, characteristic of the brain and our ability to be able to forecast much into the future and, you know, have potentially theory of mind, etc. Would you say that this is in some way potentially connected with consciousness? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of the, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Right. I mean, in, in general, <laughs> I'm not terribly interested in consciousness. I mean, it's fascinating, no, but it's because I don't think we've got any tools to really mm. get to it. It's something that I, I leave to one side. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a lot of people are really fascinated by it, in particular, the kind of more philosophical arguments. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the key things that whatever consciousness is, it does enable you to think through things and to think, okay, um, right, that policeman is making me very angry. If I thump him, uh, I will feel some relief from my irritation. But, but bad things are going to happen. And yeah. you can actually reason that. And you can say to somebody else, no, don't do that. Don't go into the cave. There might be a stuffed bear in there or a real bear, mm. even worse. You know, yeah. uh, And that can then enables you to imagine what some, you know, they're going into the cave. They're going to mm. hit the policeman, right? Don't do that. You can actually imagine, you can see, predict what they're going to do. And in some way that we don't understand, and I don't think, but I don't know, I don't think is unique to humans, hmm. that has this conscious inner monologue aspect to it hmm. where you can think things through and talk to yourself mm -hmm. and discuss those things. On the other hand, a lot of what is involved is below the level of consciousness, and you do things spontaneously. Yeah. You either do or don't hit the policeman, or you yeah. do or don't get to the cave. Or something that's even more striking is that has always intrigued me, is when you're trying to remember something. Uh, and I find this in particular with crosswords. I'm not very good at crosswords, but I can, see the, I, I can see the answer, but I don't know what it is. And it's on the tip of your tongue. You, yeah. can, you know that this word, even if you haven't got the first letter, you know it begins mm. with T. What is it? And so you've got some part of it. Yeah. But you can't directly access, I mean, and different people have different yeah. strategies. For me, both with a crossword and in general life, if I can't immediately get there, mm. I can't find the route, it's what it feels like in mm. my head, then I just forget about it. And yeah. I come back an hour later yeah. and I look at the crossword and the answer is obvious. So something somewhere yeah. at the back of my head has yeah. been Doing dealing the work. with this. Yeah, and I've, I haven't been dealing with it. Yeah. So there's lots of stuff which is taking place below the level of consciousness and it shows you that concepts we were talking about earlier on, they are represented by not only the, the concept, the pattern of neurons, but also by the word that we use for that. So, yeah, mm. it begins with T. What is it? I can't remember, but it's something, yeah. And so then eventually you, you can use the T as a tag to get in it, or maybe you mm. can't do that. You have to look at the, the – allow your brain just to, to – work out what that concept was and then to mm. bring that into whatever your consciousness is. Mm. 
So you're more of a proponent that this has been an evolutionary adaptation. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, from, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at, okay, so I don't think gorillas should be in zoos. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, you know, all primates, uh, if we just leave them in nature, then most people won't get to see them. And secondly, they'll get eaten or killed mm. by humans. But, you know, if you look at a gorilla or a chimp, Or an orangutan, and in, but in particular a gorilla, it's very difficult to yeah. avoid the impression that it's a bloke in a suit. <laughs> that <laughs> somebody just got dressed up and yeah. is looking at you because there's yeah. something about that eye contact, which is one of the ways that yeah. we communicate. And we have the perception that there is somebody else in there. And you're not a robot from Mars or a hallucination, but you are real. Uh, other people are real and I can yeah. predict what you're going to do and I can imagine what you're thinking, which is quite the most mind boggling thing. But, so, but, you yeah. know, you know, uh, when you said a, a gorilla just looking at you, I, I had this experience like a few years ago back i think in i was in cologne uh, in the zoo in cologne and you know they had a bunch of uh, different kinds of monkeys in, in different cages etc and there was this orangutan just just slouched uh, next to the window thing and you go next to him and he just literally does like this looks <laughs> looks to the side looks at you and and he's like uh, and another it, human and he was like so fucking tired of this <laughs> shit and just looking at my face it was like oh no can't deal with this right now just <laughs> please no <laughs> it was insane it yeah was i mean there, there are other videos rather happier videos of a uh, of somebody with a, uh, a a young a young orangutan on the other side and they show them a they show them a cup mm -hmm. and they put something into the cup yeah and then they spirit it away and they show the the orangutan that there's nothing in the cup and it kind of falls over and looks like it's laughing <laughs> thinks this is hysterical because it expects to see something yeah. in there it's got a brain that is predicting it yes, knows definitely. i put something in he put something in the cup it should still be there it's gone my god how did he do yeah. that it's amazing yeah. and uh, you know i mean poor old yeah. animals in zoos that is obviously <laughs> yeah. kind of going to be the most important thing that'll ever happen to them like, you know what there was a human out there once and he disappeared something how yeah. did that happen that never happens <laughs> normally <laughs> Yeah, I think um, the um, the distinction I'm I'm making when I'm asking this question whether if it's a product of natural selection if it's something that's actually useful for uh, uh, reproductive fitness isn't uh, to contrast it with something like panpsychism or some crazy mm -hmm. shit, yeah. but rather with uh, uh, some kind of a emergent phenomenon that comes from complexity, uh, which. I, In a way, I think those two could be different things. I mean, uh, because of complexity, some weird shit can happen, which yeah. isn't necessarily uh, useful, but it's just there because that's how uh, a lot of neurons work together or a lot of information works together, you know, depending mm. on your flavor of theories, etc. <laughs> so, I mean, could this be a tacked on thing that's, um, that's not necessarily uh, useful for fitness? Well, it could be, and we don't know. I think it's probably unlikely um, because there are so many, well, certainly uh, certainly in primates, it's very, it, it looks very much like many of these lineages have the same phenomena. So it's very difficult to test, of course, because you can't go to a gorilla, are you conscious, right? Yeah. So you have to do, various, like, uh... <laughs> you have to do various experiments. Um, and one of the ways that you can do this is to look at the theory of mind. I Do they know what somebody, can they imagine what somebody mm. else is thinking, right? And that could be very important, say, in avoiding conflict or knowing if I do something, then the top gorilla is going to not like that and I'll get in trouble, so mm. I need to avoid that. Or maybe I can do it out of his sight mm. and then he won't see me. And then I'll be okay. Mm. So it's not simply about being, you know, reinforced. I mean, you get you get hit by the gorilla if he sees you doing it. Right, I'm not going to do that again. It's just simply on the basis of negative reinforcement. There's also evidence that they may be taking actions to avoid being seen. Um, and so there's there's reasonable experimental evidence. It's very difficult to obtain that gorillas and chimps and even orangutans, although. The experiments that have done the orangutans don't kind of like very much may have some primitive form of a theory of mind, being able to imagine what another animal is thinking. Um, and that's not surprising, right? Because one of the things that Darwin studied, uh, he it was quite amazing. So he knew that there was going to be this problem about where what 
the link between consciousness and the brain was, right? Mm. Uh, and people were thinking about this back in the 19th century when he's just come back from uh, his voyage around the world on, on the Beagle, and he's starting to think about the, uh, the origin of species as it became. Uh, in the late 1830s, he's sitting in, uh, in London at the top of Carnaby Street, in fact. He had a, a, an apartment, and he's reading this book, and we can see this because we've actually got the, his copy of the book, and we can see his marginal notations. And he was reading a book, Popular Science at the time, saying, uh, you know, well, we don't know what the link between brain and mind is. Hmm. There is a link, but we don't know what it is, which is still pretty much where we are. And Darwin kind of draws a line down the side of this comment. He said, it doesn't matter. Hmm. Right. From Darwin says, it doesn't matter how it works. I just need to know that there is a connection between the shape of a brain and what it does. Hmm. Right. Because. He works out over the years. Natural selection, what does it do? It changes bodies. Mm. That's what natural selection does. Bodies and what they produce. What they produce in terms of colour, uh, odour, mm. and thought. Yeah. So if natural selection can change the shape of your brain, it's changing thought. You know, If you're doing something, thinking something, and that is the product mm. of a particular set of neurons, and if that being able to do that gives you a selective advantage, then that form of brain will be tend to be passed down. Hmm. And I think that's absolutely brilliant of Darwin because like me, he decided, I don't know the answer. They don't know the answer. We won't know the answer yeah. for decades. It doesn't matter. And when he uh, eventually turned to human evolution, because there's virtually nothing about human evolution in, on the origin of species uh, for all sorts of reasons, but uh, maybe some people say, well, he was worried about, you know, scaring people and he didn't want to talk about human evolution. There's an awful lot about pigeons and pigeon fanciers in there and not virtually nothing about humans. A couple of sentences. In 1871, he has to deal with the question of human evolution, partly because uh, his good friend Alfred Russell Wallace hmm. uh, had decided that humans were different. Uh, he went to a seance, in fact. <laughs> he went to a seance. These were really big in the late 19th century. Yeah. And uh, this um, this uh, medium, uh, this was in January. It's very important the day. He went to a mm -hmm. seance in January. And they're all holding hands. And the medium goes into a trance. Yeah. And then suddenly the lights, the lights go off. The lights have got to go off for some reason. The lights go off. And then the medium is now standing on the table holding some fresh flowers in January. And the flowers are covered in dew like she's just picked them. So this kind of nonsense <laughs> made Russell Wall Alfred Russell Wallace go, okay, so humans are different. There's something weird about you know, spiritualism yeah. and so on. And he ends up arguing that humans are not subject to natural selection. We didn't evolve. We're completely separate. Now, Darwin's not happy about this. And various other people started to get caught up in this mania. You can see why. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, so he thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to do it. So he wrote a book called The Descent of Man, which is generally published as, in fact, he wrote two books. It's really odd because it's called The Descent of Man and uh, Selection by Sex. But it's, in fact, two books. He wrote a book on human evolution, hmm. The Descent of Man, and then another little book on sexual selection, which are the two topics hmm. which he didn't develop in uh, the um, in the origin of species, but the bit on the descent in the, about the descent of man is primarily about what was known at the time uh, about human skeletons and human anatomy and comparative anatomy. And he got his good friend Thomas Huxley, who was an anatomist and a zoologist, to draw pictures of different ape brains, including hmm. us. And Darwin reproduces these, and he says what this shows us is that there is no difference, there is a difference of degree, not of mm. kind. In other words, certain bits are getting a bit bigger, but there's nothing that's qualitatively different. Mm. Now, the one exception to this, this is the callback for people who've been listening all the way through, the one exception to this, which Darwin actually knew about, is Broca's area. Mm. But you can't see Broca's area, right? It's not morphologically. Have, we haven't got a big lump that a, a, mm. a gorilla hat doesn't have. What we do have is a set of neurons that if you stimulate it, will or we alter their activity will change speech uh you do the same thing in a monkey or a gorilla and nothing's going to happen because they don't hmm. have Broca's area so they can't you know hey news they can't speak yes <laughs> they can't i mean whatever speech is it's very weird phenomenon that's speech is different from hearing right so hmm. Broca's area controls your speech it doesn't control your understanding hmm. of sound of speech so it's only your ability to produce it so yeah darwin has said look Natural selection changes shapes. 
It has clearly changed the shape of the brain over time. And some bits have got bigger and some bits have got smaller, but that's no different to, you know, if you look at a gorilla's arms, it's got huge, great big arms. It's got massive, great big shoulders, right? Mm. So do we. So it's a degree, difference oh, of degree. I, I try. You, you're doing very well. You're looking yeah. very, very hench, as young people would say. Um, it's a difference of degree, not of kind. We and a gorilla both have shoulders. They've got a different shape. We've both got jaws. There's mm. much bigger and so on. So the brain is no different. It's just another part of our anatomy. Now, that is that is the case. And the implication, therefore, is that although there is a clear difference between us and them, you know, we're in charge there in the cages. Yes. Uh, so that's quite clear. So something very significant happened in our evolutionary traje trajectory. People used to say it happened, you know, 40,000 years ago. I think the, all the mm. evidence in particular from Neanderthals, who are relatives who we split off from half a million years ago, uh, are that, you know, they had culture pretty much like mm. we did. The latest evidence shows that they could make tar by using a process of distillation. They put yeah. bark and the bark would drip out the tar into a, uh, they'd heat it up and then underneath the fire, you'd have a pit in which the tar would collect. And then you could use the tar for wrapping around, for keeping your your spearheads onto your spear. Mm. You'd make a bit of rope. We know that they first people to make string and rope. And then you could bind that up with tar you'd extracted from yeah. bark. So that's pretty smart, right? And uh, yeah. no ape alive today can yeah. do that. Only humans and Neanderthals. So, it seems to me more likely that whatever happened in our lineage, it happened way, way back, million, two million years ago uh, in Africa. Um, w whilst it's clear that there's something going on in gorillas and chimps, it's not the same as in us. Hmm. And their ecology isn't the same, right? So, you know, the audience that we're going to have tomorrow at Ratio, hmm. right? We're going to have 600 people sitting there. Hmm. And they're going to be listening. Maybe a few gorillas. Maybe, well, if yeah. we, you know, there may be there may be some stuffed animals <laughs> around there too. But just imagine that we had six hundred chimps, right? <laughs> it would be complete chaos, right? Yes. They are not going to sit there in a very sociable yes. way and accept that they're going to sit and understand something, you know. Unless we provide a typewriter. <laughs> if we in provide case, typewriters, uh... then who knows? We <laughs> could make a fortune. Um, but, you know, that our, our social world our, is, is based, I know this, this is not what lots of, you know, ideologues would say. We are not, we, we do enjoy competition, right? Mm. But we also enjoy cooperation. And cooperation mm. is fundamental to human society. That's how yes. we've made all this stuff. And optimization. And yeah, general. absolutely. And you Proximity. improve things and you transmit them and you share yeah. them. And this is how, this is the origin of, this is human ecology, behavioral ecology. It's cooperative work to get food, to breed, uh, to move from one area to another, to have knowledge mm. that is transmitted down the generations by communication, which might be writing of some kind or signs, or above all, it's verbal. Um, but we don't have the kind of hyper-aggressive, you know, really uh, male, and we have clearly have a patriarchy, but all the evidence suggests that is not the original form. That's something that appeared in the last 10,000 years mm. or so. Um, that in general, human societies are very peaceable. You know, that's mm. what we say to children. Play nicely together. Don't fight. We mm. do fight. We do kill. You know, we go outside of the yeah, Ten Commandments. Group, Sometimes things happen. But overall, we spend our life not beating each other up and dominating each other in the way that a chimp does. Right? Mm. So something has happened in our lineage, which is to do, I presume, is to do with our ecology. The, the mm. pressures on us. In Africa, whatever it was a million years ago, led to a slightly different form of social organization, hmm. which is different from that of our close, <clears throat> different from that of our close relatives, but which has enabled us to have success. I mean, and ultimately mm. planetary success. We spread mm. all over mm. the world. Mm. So it's quite remarkable what we've done in such a very short space of time, you know, kind yeah. of 50,000 years. It's Nothing else has done that. The only thing that spread so quickly, I think, are the chickens. And we, we've we taken them with us. <laughs> you know, when, when the aliens come <laughs> in a few million years and the alien archaeologists land yes. and they start digging, they're going to find all of a sudden, in geological terms, right? An iPhone. These, these, well, they'll find a few iPhones. <laughs> but all of a sudden, they're going to find human bones everywhere and they're going to find chicken bones everywhere because <laughs> we've taken them with us. Okay, so the alarm will go off in about a minute. Let's oh, okay. take a short break and then yeah, we'll continue. That's great.